All right, guys, we are back with part two with Dr. Scott Stevenson. And today we have Paul as well. Paul wasn't here on the last podcast we did because uh, Canada doesn't allow for people to go to coffee shops and, and do podcasts and stuff. So, um, but we're glad you're back. How was your, how was your weekend? Uh, the weekend was really good. We had dinner with my mom before we left and then uh, spent the weekend with Olivia's family in Toronto. Um, they just put down some new capacity regulations that cut capacity indoors by 50%. So a lot of the coffee shops aren't allowing indoor dining. So you can't like sit down with your laptop and work anymore. And uh, unfortunately, Olivia's parents' internet isn't the greatest. So wasn't able to join, but it was really relaxing. I ended up doing a lot less work than I had planned on, which for the first time in my life, I felt didn't feel guilty about and uh, ready to get back to it. It was great. Yeah, How about nice. you? Yeah, same mental break, physical break, just did a lot of like self exploration type stuff did uh, was out on the trails for, you know, four hours, five hours, and then talked to my parents, talked to my mom and dad for like an hour, because my dad's in Virginia and my mom's in uh, Washington. And um, so obviously don't get to spend a lot of time with them. So I try to talk to them on the phone. And it was good. It was good relaxing. And uh, like you said, not a lot done, but validated through like the year of hard work and knowing that like as long as you stay on top of things you never feel bad about a weekend spent relaxing exactly that's exactly how I felt it's like yeah I'm good how about you Dr. Scott just relaxing I know you always stay pretty busy with with work and stuff but did you take some time off I was going to say the first thing when you said self-exploration, I'm like, oh, you did it like a two-day ayahuasca trip, didn't you? <laughs> I, was thinking, done. Um, I just, yeah, kind of all the days mixed together. My, um, my mom is newly remarried and they were planning on being up with, with his family. So I didn't have any, like I had no one here. As it turned out, they both got sick, no COVID. They were sick, but I was nursing one of my dogs. Um, we're okay. doing, uh, we're doing like remove all the cancerous stuff, like one, one operation at a time. And she just gotten a little chunk of her lung taken out. Mm. So, um, Jeez. so, you know, I got to take care of my pup. Yeah. And, uh, and I just work on, you know, I've got all the, I got, I'm writing articles and like, you know, communicating with people and then practicing my German. I think we talked about that before and yeah, uh, yeah. working on my, um, this time I was working on a, a swivel reel trailer so I can haul my motorcycle behind my truck. More oh, easily. nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I, was that day? I, I can't remember. It was somewhere around there. I literally spent like four hours. It's an interesting thing. Like it's a very meditative experience. Some of this work because some of it with like guys who work in mechanic shops and I don't have like all the fancy tools, but I spent like four hours just on it with a grinder, just grinding, trying to remove a piece of metal. I could, it's about that big. But I had to do that in order to get two pieces. I have a two-point hitch that I had to get into my truck to balance the swivel wheel. And there was a center point that was just like it was one about it was about two inches into where my bumper was. And either I cut the bumper off, um, which I didn't want to do, it's because of a new bumper, or I cut like a, just a little piece off of there. So I just worked a grinder for like four hours, me and sparks flying all over the place. Yeah. You might be the most yeah. interesting person I've ever <laughs> spoken to. There's so <laughs> many things. <laughs> I just yeah, I can, like exploring, you know, so I can, yeah. yeah, the exploration stuff I think is, is a great thing to always have. Right. Because then even if you're in solitude, even if you are by yourself, you're, you're exploring, you're doing stuff, you're challenging yourself. And the grinding thing I can relate to, like when I was younger, I would work with my dad and he, he did yacht refinishing. So we would sand boats for hours and fiberglass and do all that stuff. And once you get to work and you, you find some type of rhythm to it, it just becomes very repetitive in nature but it also is very soothing and meditative as well it's a flow experience to yeah some degree. it can be yeah yeah and the thing that i i've like really enjoyed over the past maybe like maybe close to a decade almost five six eight years probably is that nothing ever goes right <laughs> that's okay like right as, so so it's really it's such a kind of um almost like a, a microcosm for dealing with the big things that happen in life. So I go in there and, you know, um, you know, you try to get a, like, like once I spent, I think eight hours when I told my mom what I'd done, she's like, you spent eight hours and what did you do? And I removed three bolts from the underside of my truck and I spent <laughs> like five hours because one of the bolts was just rusted in. 
and it snapped off when I was trying to twist it off. So I had to, I, I had to go to the hardware store once, I think, and I came back and I had to drill out the bolt and it's like, okay, you know, it's just, you just look at things as they are and you just, and like, I can handle the single singular moment that I'm in and I just keep on going. Like, I'm going to do this eventually. Maybe there's something I can do that's better, but so when those the frustration wells up and you want to get pissed and like start, you know, slamming things, um, it's just like, that doesn't serve any purpose. And after you've done that enough times, I guess that's when wisdom accrues enough knowledge, you know, builds up to the point where you're wise enough to say, Hey, you know, it's just a bolt. I'll get it done. If not today, tomorrow, the next day. But so it's, it's nice to, it's like good training for the, like sitting in a traffic jam, you know, where people are like, like why are you flipping out? Like, this is a chance to listen to an audiobook, you know, right. or, or do something else. So those little projects are like, like shit always, there's always some weird thing going on, like, especially with electronics, but it's, it's actually quite fascinating. It's like, okay, you're, you're playing with me universe, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I got it. Like, we'll, we'll see what, I'll see what I can come up with here. I like the challenge. So that's kind of why I enjoy those things is, is, um, like it really doesn't matter. It's just a Jeep or a RV or whatever, but it's good training for like the bigger things in life where, you know, like, okay, my dog's got cancer. We're just going to do everything we possibly can and keep taking out organs, you know, spleen, part of the colon, the lung, whatever it takes. We'll just keep on going. There's nothing more you can do. So, yeah. 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 I can relate to that a lot through like jujitsu. It's all about problem solving based on who you're going against. And then even getting into like the ultra endurance type stuff where it's like, you don't plan on something going wrong. You just, but you know, something will go wrong. If you're doing a 50 mile race, a hundred mile race, like how do you problem solve when those things arise? And it's not, I quit. It's like, how can I continue to go and get to that finish line? If you're getting choked out, it's like, instead of tapping, how can you troubleshoot that? How can you problem solve that? And I think that that problem yeah. solving mentality is great, but it also, and I don't know if you ever get this, but it also lends people to think that like, you just don't care about a lot of stuff because you're kind of stoic in nature. It's like, eh, yeah, well, you know, this happened, but like, maybe we'll figure some other stuff out. And it's like, do you just not care? Like, do you ever get that? That people just think that like, you're just kind of stoic and problem solving, nothing really gets to you sort of thing. There was once, um, I remember this because it was just sort of so funny. Um, someone said that to me. Someone said it wasn't stoic. It's was actually like a, really quite a compliment. It was uh, to bring it back to bodybuilding. So this was like, so in the like maybe 2007 or 2008, something around there. I can't remember which year it was, but so I've been doing like the Arizona, Mr. Arizona for years and just trying to like win my weight class, you know, or just get nationally qualified. And I did that numerous times and trying to win my weight class. Eventually I won my class in the show. And there was a guy who um, uh, he had literally abscesses that looked like they're about to burst on both his delts and his quads. And he was in my weight class. He was in, he wasn't in as great. I was, I was, I out conditioned him, but mm -hmm. he was bigger than me. And without those, those um, abscesses, I mean, they look awful. They looked really painful. Um, he would have, you know, great flow and bubbly muscle, which is like a really good genetics. Um, but the conditioning wasn't there. And those things were sort of like a lot of judges just say, okay, that's just, you know, de facto, you're not going to win looking like right. that. So anyway, um, I actually, a lot of people were thinking I was going to win my class and blah, blah, blah. And I did, and I didn't. So we we're up on stage and I didn't win. And it's like, so what, you know, it's just like a body. Like I don't like the trophies don't matter. And part of this probably comes from having trained with Dave Henry for so long. So I always was like reminded every single day that, you know, yeah, as good as I think I might be, I'm not really that good. <laughs> yeah, you're not David Henry. <laughs> I'm not David Henry. Um, so I didn't, I didn't win. And I actually kind of, the guy who won, I think he felt a little guilty that he'd won. Cause he, he knew like, kind of like that maybe the judges could have gone the other way because of those abscesses and the other thing. And, um, but I was, you know, I was unfazed by it. Like literally I was, and someone said, it's like, what are you like enlightened or some shit? Like, how come you're not pissed? You should be like, you know, you should be throwing a great Craig Titus like tantrum, right? you know? And I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter. And it's, yeah. um, you know, the, the Zen Cohen story of the, of the, of the, the Taoist farmer, the, somebody's called the Buddhist farmer. Do you know that, you know, that, um, no, I'm not familiar story? with that one. I can tell it real quick. You can find it on the internet. There's various, there's various um, versions of it. So there's a, a Taoist farmer and he's, you know, takes care of his, he farms, you know, to, to survive. And his, his horse goes lame. 
so his neighbors in the village they hear about this they're like oh this is terrible you know this is what are you going to do you know you you need a horse like how are you going to how are you going to farm and take care of your family? And well, it just so happens the village is having a, uh, and there's variations on this. So this isn't, I'm probably telling one of the aberrations of the story, but so the village has a, uh, a festival and just so happens they're raffling off a young stud horse and he wins like just randomly, just he gets picked for the lottery. They're like, oh, that's great. You know? And, oh, sorry. When they, when he said, you know, Hey, that's horrible. Your house, your, your horse is, is lame. He's like, yeah, maybe it's good. Maybe it's bad, you know? Yeah. And so when he wins the horse, like, oh, this is great. And he's like, yeah, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. So his son, who he needs on the, on the farm, is, is trying to break in the horse. And his son gets bucked from the horse and breaks his leg. So now his son can't work the, work the farm, which he needs to do all the things. So the, the neighbors come back around like, oh, that's just awful. Like, I can't believe this bad luck. And Farmer's like, yeah, maybe it is, maybe it's not. It's just about that time they come around conscripting for the army yeah. and go off to fight in the war on the front where he would most likely die for sure. And of course, because his leg is broken, he can't go to fight. So they're like, oh, what a stroke of luck that he happened to have broken his leg. And so now he's going to live, you know, the war will be over by the time they want to bring him into the, into the, into the field. And he's like, maybe it is, maybe it's not. So you could just keep on keeping those, all yeah. those situations, you never really know whether something is going to be quote good or, or bad. You know, sometimes <laughs> even when someone dies, it gives you, you know, the sense of how much more important life could be, um, you know, and it, that can happen for thousands of people in a way that makes their quality of life rise in a way that, that um, maybe is, you know, a good thing relative to having lost that person. Maybe that's something that person in, in, um, you know, had they been able to control, would have wanted even. So the worst of things can sometimes be the, you know, be the best of things. But those those qualifications are just things that we we impose upon reality because that's what humans do. But it doesn't always serve us to do that. So sometimes like, ah, maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Yeah. So Definitely. anyway, yeah, I, I like that story. Yeah, I've, I heard that story last week, actually. I just didn't know the name. Oh, of it, OK. It or not. Yeah. I, don't, right. I was listening yeah. to a podcast and I heard that last week and. I thought that was, it was really interesting because I tell that to my clients all the time. It's like, don't get so high on a number on the scale. Don't get so low on a number of scale. It's just a metric. It is what it is. It just tells us something that is going on, but it's not something that is worth celebrating. And it's not something that's worth getting overly frustrated about because if you have these highs and lows all the time throughout your check-ins or throughout training, then that's what you rely on to drive you to be motivated to go to the gym or to, to work harder when it shouldn't be the motivation, it shouldn't be the underlying mechanisms of like why you're doing the things that you're doing. And that if you yeah. completely rely on that, then you're going to be disappointed most of the time. You know, I would, I might amend that to, and this is like kind of a Buddhist idea that the, the notion of it being attached to those states. Yeah. So those are states that like, you know, that the, like when like you're in the gym and you're like, you just flip the switch and all systems go like you're just one you're redlining that's a blast yeah that's but but if you can't do that if you're attached to that and you want that so that's where the like the longing to have something that you can't have so it's like enjoy those moments you know live like grieve appropriately if you need to grieve yeah but but it's having the perspective to not be attached to any of those extremes but just recognize that those are states that you know maybe you're good maybe you're bad yeah, and I like yeah, that. so I, I I like what you're I know what you're saying, but um, you don't also I I think what can happen people take that on and then they want to just kind of dampen the human spirit, you know, mm -hmm. um, and like well you know like I'll just you know don't don't want to get too sad because you know don't want to get too far down that but maybe you need to really grieve the loss of someone you know who was really close to you yeah you know or maybe you need to like finally just like fuck get happy as shit because you finally won whatever you want or you finally achieved that but it's just being able to recognize that it can all be gone in a split second so don't be attached to any particular moment and that's where i think the hook comes you know that can like drag you in directions where where you're suffering in a buddhist sort of way yeah and i like that i like the addendum there that worked out perfectly that makes a little yeah. ton of sense yeah i, I yeah. find like with, with stoicism and being just a calm person People think you don't feel, but you actually like, I feel very deeply 
Like I get very yeah. sad or I get very happy, but I understand it's not, it's a state. It's, it's a passing emotion. Mm-hmm. It, it flows through. So you just, you feel it, you're in it, and then you let it go and bring something else in. Um, yeah. I just don't think people get grasp that fully, but yeah, it's a good, it's a good opportunity for conversation. But yeah, well that, okay, we, we can, we can go way up on, we we're going to go way up on top. Deep on this. <laughs> you got a million things coming to my head, so um we should probably go back start talking about hormones before we we get into uh enlightenment topics and those sorts of things yes sir definitely um so uh, with bodybuilding and stuff do you still go to shows i know nationals just came up in orlando did you go to that by any chance or i I wanted to i was taking care of my pup taking care of the dog yeah yeah (laughs) yeah. like we were i was waiting and waiting and i I was thinking we're gonna have to do we're gonna chemo was gonna be one of our opportunities and so I was like literally waiting to hear back from them. Um, yeah, the vets weren't the great, with, the greatest with uh, um, communication. So they're always, I always sort of put them first. I didn't want to like, of you know, be gone out of town. It's like, oh, you know, we could start chemo now because luckily I think we're in the clear and, and me being on top of things allowed that to happen. But yeah, I go to, I go to shows. The, the Tampa Pro Show is the weekend of my mom's birthday. I've missed it like five times now because of that, but you know, I go down for her birthday. So it's weird the way I miss shows, but when they're here, I want to go, you know, I yeah. go went to the Olympia this year. It's last oh, year. Nice. Yeah. yeah. The year before is because in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I go to, I do all that when I can, but yeah. Um, yeah. Right, the so, thing, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to ask you if you did went, if you, what you thought about it and stuff, but I don't know if you follow it even when you don't go. Yeah. Carlos Thomas is a, just like, you know, saw him coming along. Well, I think I started following on Instagram just because it's such a freak. His legs yeah. are crazy. Everything, everything. Yeah, yeah. His legs are just ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was yeah. awesome. And a buddy of mine, uh, Justin Shire, he won his pro card. He was, yeah. the, I think he was heavyweight. Yeah. And Nate Spear got his card Nate too. Nate Spear, yeah, yeah, it was a good, yeah. it was a good show. I was, I was really impressed by the really deep the talent there. Yeah, yeah, I so wanted to go because I had actually several friends competing there, and um, yeah, I was busy, I was busy with, uh, busy with my pup. Yeah, so, priorities, right? Priorities. Yeah, gotta do it. <laughs> All right, so we went over. If you guys aren't familiar with uh, part one of the podcast, we went over kind of sex hormones and and their role within the human body. And Dr. Scott uh, gave a a lot of really good insight into um, a very hard topic to cover in in a podcast, but we condensed it down as much as we could. And um, if you guys ever follow Dr. Scott and listen to his podcast and go to any of his seminars, he goes over a lot of that stuff too in, in further detail. So definitely check out all the stuff that he does with his, uh, with his podcasts, um, muscle minds. And, and anytime he does a seminar, go to that as well. But we thought it'd be good to maybe answer some questions on the topic as well and uh, have him back on for part two. And uh, we got some pretty good questions and we'll just go over and knock them out one by one. And uh, we'll start with the, the first one. And um, the question is, and we may reframe the questions as, as we see fit uh, to make a little bit more sense or to lend a little bit more brevity to it. Uh, but in terms of safer use protocols, which is very popular um, term thrown out there now uh, over the last like three or four years, what exactly does that mean? And what are some of the negative ramifications of uh, PD use that we should look out for? So a huge topic. Um, safer use, there's nothing, I don't think there's anything tricky about that term. It means try to avoid dangers. <laughs> So be right. safe and the dangers would be the negative ramifications, the side effects of PED use. Um, so like literally you could do, and I think some people do, there are several people who are doing classes on this. Yeah. yeah. I, I know actually Shelby Starnes, um, who's been criticized kind of in this context, but he actually has a book um, on for bodybuilders that's available. I think it may be even free on his site. It kind of runs through basics of blood work and that kind of stuff. It's been around for, for years. Okay. Um, yeah, so people can go check that out. Uh, so many things. PEDs is a huge topic too. So are we, if we're just going into steroids, so yeah. rather than using the term hormones, yeah. which sometimes gets used because insulin's a hormone, actually growth hormone's a hormone, but I think people mean steroids, right. anabolic androgenic steroids or what the literature calls that. 
um, we've got a lot of different potential things that can happen depending on the person. Like literally the list is, if someone wants to um, look into the research literature, there's a, a guy by the name of Pope, last name is Pope. And he's, he's done a lot of work on um, uh, muscle dysmorphia and bigorexia and tried to be the sort of the main voice in the research about the harmful effects of PED use in this or steroid use. So we're talking about androgens here. Um, and obviously that we got, an, it's an anergenic anabolic steroid, which is the, the compound we're, we're considering. The androgenic side is the side that basically those actions, and I think I covered this to some degree in one of the slides we did, it's been too long for me to remember exactly what I said, but um, we're looking for the anabolic actions in particular on skeletal muscle. That's, that's the effect we want. And the rest of it basically will be side effects um, unless someone's trying is doing a, a like a transgender surgery or, or a sex change surgery, and they're they're looking to use the androgens in order to go from female to male. So, where do we start? So the, the they need to be processed first and foremost. The liver is our main detoxification. Um, or and you guys just stop me anywhere. I'll just kind of ramble here, you know, for a while. Okay. But we can just kind of have a conversation about the liver is the thing that's going to have to be processing. The steroids and the the thing that the there's basically two forms of administration oral or injectable and the orals are actually intentionally modified typically it's a seven alpha methylation so or sorry 17 so if you look at the i covered this actually in my one of my last podcasts look at the 17th carbon maybe in one of the pictures i have one if, if we want to show throw one up maybe afterwards you could add it um this is the same carbon where they either add an ester an esterified fatty acid for an injectable like testosterone enanthate, which is enanthic acid, esterified to the testosterone molecule, or you can add a methyl group there to another, um, for instance, dianabol is, bold, is methylated boldenone, essentially, equipoise. And that methylation makes it such that those oral, oral steroids are, are orally available because when they go into the system, um, you get a you have a, a phenomenon that your 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 system is very uh, it wants to make sure that there's some screening that happens when things make it way in your into your bloodstream. So the first place that the blood leaving your gastrointestinal system goes through is your liver. So your liver has sort of a first shot, the first pass, as it's called. So this is this first pass phenomenon you hear spoken about all the time. So. Because of that methylation, it actually makes it very difficult for the liver to break those um, and to process those, those chemicals um, that are, or the steroids that are methylated. So it, it does two, two effects, the desired effect, such that it gets into the bloodstream and then it can go about its business, binding to the antigen receptor, whichever one it may bind to. There's another question we can get into that. Um, having the psychological effects that it may have, having the anabolic effects that it may have, kind of the androgenic and all the side effects it may have. Uh, and it also has liver, hypoxic, liver um, toxic effects because the liver is stressed in doing this. What, um, what you will see, um, there's several stages, actually I cover this a little bit in my book, but several stages of liver, liver detoxification, basically kind of two stages, but the idea is to um, change the molecules configuration so that it can be bound to something like a sulfate, sulfated in some way. So then it can be, it can be taken out of the body and excreted, get gotten rid of. Um, and that will inactivate the molecule as well. And in doing that, um, there's also free radical stress. So that's one of the, that's a very damaging thing because free radicals are basically, typically you're thinking of unpaired electrons on these molecules and they're floating around and basically it just wreak havoc everywhere they go. Anytime you've got a free radical molecule, it's disrupting the way the molecules are supposed to be working in your cells. So it's, it'd be kind of like, um, if you had like, uh, uh, um, what are those uh, silly putty or those super balls, you know, that bounce all over the place, yeah. <laughs> super ball, it just bounces everywhere. That's kind of what a free radical is. It's just bouncing around and just poking holes in the walls everywhere. Right. And destroying everything. Painful. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of like a Super Bowl, um, and so you want to you want to get that's the that's the toxic effects that happens from actually many things that the liver has to detoxify because that's just the nature of um, of how it how this is done in the liver the steps that are, are that are done you look at things 
like uh, alpha lipoic acid or N-acetylcysteine or silymarin or liver 52, um, which is an herbal formulation. Those, the primary mechanism of action that you see in e even Udka um, and, and, and Tudka is, um, uh, uh, you guys familiar with Udka? From yes, hydroxycholic acid, yeah. Tudka is a taurine conjugate. <clears throat> taurine itself is also um, a free radical quencher. So it's an antioxidant. So basically all those chemicals I just, I just sort of ran through, those all have free radical quenching abilities. And that's why they work so well as liver detoxifiers because they're countering that free radical producing effect that the liver just sort of has to go through in order to get rid of the, it's sort of the lesser of two evils in get, getting rid of this toxic drug that's come in, this, this foreign drug that's come in. So that's what goes on in the liver. So what you see then <clears throat> potentially is our liver tumors, um, even like, you know, I think there's a couple case studies of like a liver, you know, carcinoma, something like that. You know, obviously, you know, cancer can be caused by many, many, many things. So right. someone might have, who knows what exactly what the causes were, but, and when those cells are stressed um, and liver has a tremendous regenerative capacity, when those cells are stressed, some of them are going to just die. They die off. And when that happens, um, the li quote unquote liver enzymes are released into the blood. So ALT and AST, mm -hmm. so the transaminase. Um, enzymes involved in amino acid metabolism, when those cells are, 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 um, are basically they die because of the stress and because there's so much turnover, those enzymes get released. So when those enzymes get elevated, that suggested that the liver is working hard, the liver is stressed. So getting to like the first kind of direct answer to this question of things we can look for, liver stress, especially when it comes to orals. So when you're thinking about liver stress too, you're also thinking about digestive properties within the body as well. Because if the liver starts to take a hit, then yes. your ability to digest food and, and all those other processes are going to take a hit as well, because the liver is kind of one of the main filtration and processes for that as, as well. So when you're thinking about in terms of like safer use, the idea of being on orals and having that mess with your liver um, from a long-term perspective, like 12 weeks, 14 weeks, 16 weeks, that may cause more harm than good. So these are something that you would do in like a very short-term burst to not allow it to be um, extremely toxic, or is it something that you would do at a lower dosage to alleviate the toxicity? Like which one would be more suited towards that safer use protocol, shorter windows or, or lower dosages? So... Um, many people would say, and, and, you know, my thought would be, if you're looking for like a safe use, orals, just don't do orals at all. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, yeah. you know, just avoid them all together. Um, what you mentioned there was, is important. The liver is, a, is technically an organ of the digestive system and it's producing bile. It's going to help you emulsify fat. So those can be properly digested and assimilated. So that's why like, you know, like Anadrol is one that, you know, is renowned for just ruining people's appetites. Yeah. Um, generally, I think with, and orals would be a main contributor to this, trying to get a general answer to what you're getting at there. Your, your question is that there is, um, as you increase, there's a dose response for basically every, every drug and steroids, there's a dose response. And it may be that at some point, given combination of steroids with the total weekly dosage of thousand milligrams or whatever it might be, you don't have the maximal anabolic effect that could come from that combination of drugs if you used more. But using more creates so much toxicity. And, I, and I've always sort of had the sense that, you know, probably that toxicity is manifesting in ways that are countering to growth, other than the obvious one, which, you've, which we're, we're talking about now, is that if you can't eat enough food, you're not going to foster progress. So right. You need to have the energy to support the muscle growth. So, you know, someone who, you know, just goes hog wild on, you know, on oral, like a, a heavy dose of orals for a long, prolonged period of time, and then runs into an appetite wall where they can't get the food down. They can't gain weight because their appetite's so poor. Um, and plus you, you feel, you feel crappy. Yeah. And if someone feels that bad, then you can't train properly. Um, and 
you know, there's, there's something probably going on, you know, this might be, you're not going to see this study, this might be measured or at least sort of quantified or tracked with IGF-1, um, you know, which is a general um, measurement of anabolism. So you take someone who's toxed out, all other things being equal versus someone who's not, um, the general, their general, their nitrogen balance is going to be highly correlated to IGF-1 levels in the blood. So you might see that someone literally is becoming more catabolic just because they're toxed out. They've got toxins in their system. Yeah. You know, you, yeah. If you like alcohol is some kind of, thing that it does, but it's, it's can be pretty toxic too. It messes up membrane fluidity, which is important for cells to be able to, to function just in a very basic general way. But um, so anyway, if you're, if you're taking in too many orals and you're toxing yourself out, um, then you're not going to be able to recover properly. You're not going to be able to eat enough. You're not going to be able to train, train as hard as you might, might be able to do otherwise. That's all going to be counter to your gain. So more might, might, might technically produce a stronger effect on the antigen receptors. But in all, all, all being said, you're shooting yourself in the foot in doing that. So um, there's different ways, you know, people, the, the, there's, there are things that can, like one approach, if someone would want to use orals, and this actually pertains to one of the questions that was, is later in the list. <clears throat> where it was, one of, it was a section one, this is the next question actually, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, so we'll kind of cover it a bit here now, is that some, especially orals, have a central effect. So, yeah. you know, halo testin is the one that's kind of known for like, doesn't do shit for muscle mass, but you know, that's what powerlifters take that for two weeks beforehand because yeah. you just, you know, you want to just destroy, you know, gravity at its, its root, you know, right. you want to bend the bar um, and then throw it off the platform. So those sorts of orals that have that effect that hopefully would have some sort of an anabolic action too, or ones that body like super draw is one that, you know, some guys, people would use. So you, you, some people would take orals with a sort of a drug timing approach, sort of like a nutrient timing approach and use those orals only where they could have a doubled effect. You've got the neurological effect. You see, so you, you get amped up for your big training sessions. And then maybe you got the orals available for, you know, they're in and out of your blood in 10, 12 hours or a day, you know, probably totally gone. And then you have a, at least a day's recovery in between. So your liver has a chance to rejuvenate and you detox a little bit. So that might be a situation. And I'm not suggesting anyone do any, any, right, anything, right. but just kind of, no, no. some people are just going to do it, you know? Yeah. So um, if this is maybe a better, better alternative, it would be, you know, instead of using, I don't know, 50 mil, if you're, if a, for a male, 50 milligrams of, or let's say 20 milligrams of Dianabol every day, they might be able to half the overall dose and use 20 milligrams three times a week. Right. And on training then, days, on training days, right. You know, 10 and 10. And then, and it doesn't have any impact on their appetite. Actually, some people will feel pretty good on Diana ball. So, and that would cut down on that. And that would be, and then use that strategy to try to get the most use the principle that I talk about all the time, get the most from the least. Yeah. And so I don't know if you're resensitizing at all with that 24 days off, 24 hours off, but uh, it's a big question as to what's happening with the antigen receptors and probably that orals are not binding to the classical genomic antigen receptor. Anyway, the binding affinity studies suggest they really don't, um, which is kind of mind boggling, but yeah. there's a second antigen receptor that, that really doesn't get addressed. I feel like I'm the only one who ever talks about it, but I've, um, that's definitely something that the research is, is pretty much um, nailed down. It's there. It's, it's a G protein related membrane bound antigen receptor that isn't usually addressed in, in like literally any of the resistance training studies or most of the, most of the anabolic steroid reviews, just some of the, only the gene jockeys get into that stuff. But yeah. so that's a way to like, try to get, you know, get that immediate sense that you would like, where you can feel it working. Maybe that tells you it's working more anabolically and you're limiting the dose. So it's kind of in a nutrient timing where it's going to be most supportive of, of, of helping with, um, a positive protein balance when you've just turned on all those mechanisms with the training. And if there's an anti-catabolic effect, for instance, binding with the cortisol receptor, that could be helpful then too, to help, help get the most from those heavy training sessions recovery yeah. wise. So by understanding those mechanisms should allow you to understand when you would deploy those type of orals, which is the important thing I, I would assume. We need the yeah. most. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so perfect. 
I think fun. too, like we talked a little bit about biofeedback with the liver, right? We're talking about appetite issues. Yeah. One thing that one thing that anecdotally people will see is as you get more toxic, your your delayed onset muscle soreness will go up. Yeah. So more more global inflammation. Oh, excuse me. More global inflammation. Uh, you're going to have more oxidative stress. Uh, again, the decrease in appetite. You might not be able to eat as much and recover as well. So you're kicking yourself in the foot and like the safer use model, the safer use mo uh, model tends to be just in, in, in my understanding, how to get the most out of the least, how to get all the benefits or most of the benefits without any of the, or as much of the drawbacks. Um, and, you know, to Tony's question of dosage versus duration, it seems to me that with a safer use model, the suggestions are longer, lower cycle lengths and dosages versus shorter, higher. Right. And with this, this kind of tapered approach to dosage and deploying of, of compounds, which, you know, Tony and I are both data guys. So if you're gathering data, you're gathering biofeedback, and then you say, okay, do I need to increase my dosage? If like, what is telling me that that needs to go up or are there other factors? So can you speak a little bit to the interaction between, you know, deploying compounds, talking about those negatives and how we balance the two a little bit? Yeah, there's a lot there. You said a lot too, man. That was a nice, nice comment. Um, so the idea of, longer getting the most from the least absolutely makes sense for sure right um longer durations and lo part of that the way i see it is that increments in in everything that you would that you would do is food wise or even even when you're dieting down like removing food to try to uh, try to um get as much of an effect as you can from the smallest change and allow that give that time to manifest mm -hmm. so Let's say, for instance, um, just for the sake of having kind of a concrete example, um, we want to examine that idea of small doses for long durations. And this is going to be a matter of the individual very much. And I, I'll come back to that in a second. Yeah. But let's say someone gets on very well with Dianabol, Anavar, and Turinabol. Those are their orals. And those are the only ones they're ever going to touch. That's what they'll use. Um, the, the, and those all have different effects for them. And that's, you know, you could, you could, you could state that there's, there's something different there because if you look at, for instance, women who are very, very sensitive to the antigens and women can, they will see like widely variable effects of different antigens. Guys can't tell nearly as well. So there's something to say for using a different compound. Um, I had a friend and I actually, there's some literature that's looked into this. I had a friend who had crazy whiplash when he was younger and he literally kind of had to always take anti-inflammatories, non steroidal anti-inflammatories to, to combat his headaches. And he had it under control. And what he finally figured out he had to do was just rotate his NSAIDs. Mm. It was a different one every day at the dose that worked for him. And, but if he kept on the same NSAID, his, his headaches would creep back in and then the, they'd stop working. So, you know, you could, there's some differences in the, 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 the COX-1 and COX-2 isoforms and how they're working, but basically there's <laughs> nothing on paper that should have explained exactly what was going on there. So there's something to say for rotating amongst those things, which you know, have an effect minus the side effects that you're willing to put up with. So as opposed to, let's say someone who says, I'm going to do, you know, six weeks on Diana ball, let's say, and again, none of this is advice or suggestions, but they've, they've determined that Anavar, Turina ball and Diana ball are all viable options for them. They might do, you could even do something as long as, you know, I wouldn't suggest this as a first, a first strategy because you don't know what's working, Yeah. Um, but they, they might rotate through those over the course of a week, or they might do two weeks on one, two weeks on the next, two weeks on the other, because they found, you know, I, when I take it every other day, let's say they're doing that on the like legs and back days or legs back and maybe kind of a more full body day, they can feel it. And then after about, five, six works out, six, six workouts, they don't feel it as much. Then they switch and they don't feel Anivar anyway, but they can just see that it has an effect on their physique or whatever, whatever it does for that person. So 
that's there's something to say for exactly what you're saying like the lowest amount that's going to that's going to give you an increment in adaptation minus the negative side effects but there's also something just like with training there's something to say for variety and novelty so novelty of drug use i hate, I hate to like i hear these words coming out of my mouth but when you add a new drug you get a new effect Right. So if you're going to kind of combine and get the most you possibly can, get the most from the least, using smaller amounts with some rotational frequency makes sense because you'll have an adaptation to the drug um, where its effects will, will be diminished. So you might be, for instance, and, and this is, you know, this is not something you're going to see studied, but it might be that, like, let's say someone's going to give themselves nine weeks of low dose oral use because they're going really low. Um, they might get more out of like rotating every week on those three orals that I mentioned before, three rounds of that, as opposed to just sticking on one, you know, yeah. Diana ball for those nine weeks. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny, like as much as bodybuilders love to talk about drugs, <laughs> you know, like the training protocols are crazy. Like right. everyone you know, doing like this, it gets so, so, so crazy, but, the drug and the drug some of the drug protocols are, can be crazy too but that just sort of makes sense if someone's if you're looking to get that stimulatory effect and avoid the side effects which tend to accrue kind of like what you were just talking about Paul and that you know they, they accumulate over time so uh, not in the first couple of weeks you know it's this spot it's after you know five weeks of anadrol that like okay this is this is adding up here so um, yeah that's 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 a thought you know that that you can rotating amongst things and then getting synergy from, you know, those combinations. There was a guy that was on my pod or actually was a guy that um, lats from professional muscle. Casey Reed is his name. He doesn't care that we say his name, but he, he had spoken to, I believe it was a Russian bodybuilder um, who many, many moons ago, the guy had been competing for years at a very high level. And when he first started using gear, he basically, um, tried everything that was available to him, like 10 or 12 different basic substances and incrementally uh, in, in adjusted the dose upward until he got what he thought was okay. This is, these are sides that I'm not, I don't want to put up with. And he very slowly, he did that. He did it for each of them. And then he sought out his own personal combinations and he would then use them in those amounts that he had previously established in a way where he could avoid the, 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 the he got synergy out of the two compounds without an additive effect of, of the, the side effects. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've heard a lot too when explained like with the safer use model is the idea of, you know, you take testosterone to X amount and then once this amount gives you the negative side effects, you decrease it a little bit so you don't have those negative side effects. Then you maybe add in a DHT or a 19 nor and the testosterone stays exactly where it's at because that's where the side effects don't occur. And then you add that to get the doses. So say you want to do a thousand milligrams and that's like your sweet spot a week. 250 tests is one. And then if you go to 300, you start to get side effects. So you stay at 250, then you add in the other stuff to get you to that thousand milligrams so that you're constantly trying to avoid the negative side effects by adding in more of a, a kitchen sink approach to, to the stuff instead of just the traditional like 1500 milligrams of testosterone right or, yeah. or something along those lines Oof. and there's going to be some limit to that of course you know like you couldn't say well you know i could use if I, as long as i keep everything below 200 milligrams i can use 15 things you know right <laughs> and then can okay, i have a three grams i've got no sides um, <laughs> yeah. so like what the things that uh probably we should cover like i'll just basically the liver is liver stress um there's cardiovascular stresses because the liver stress, your cholesterol levels, your lipid profile can kind of go to shit. Um, orals especially will decrease HDL, the good cholesterol, um, because of the increased hematocrit and sometimes just blood pressure um, yeah. and just in general, which can come from the increased hematocrit. This can tend to put some stress on your kidneys. Having a poor cholesterol profile doesn't help either as far as that goes. Um, there's, of course, the psychological effects. Um you know, like, as they say, you can't spell asshole without anadrol. That was the old <laughs> saying, you know, so that can happen or trend balloon issues, you know, um, sleeping effects. We mentioned GI issues. So there's a, there's a laundry list of things that can happen 
if you just go hog wild. And the thing is that you really, this is a, a it's a very individual situation. Um, like here's an example from my own life. My, my grandmother had rheumatoid arthritis and she lived to be in her late nineties and the oh. doctors we had couldn't do anything they could do about it. She took aspirin, like a lot of aspirin and aspirin is just destroys the gut for some yeah. people. Like again, well, she took a hundred aspirin a week Jeez. for decades and didn't oh, have a problem. She was just fine. Never an issue, but it took care of her arthritis for the most part. Yeah. So that was just, that was just her. Um, so people are going to have different tolerances. It doesn't necessarily mean because you don't feel anything though, that you're not having issues. Right. You know, who knows? Maybe, you know, it, it, because she lives so long, I, I'm guessing that what she was noticing was that was actually reflective of the, that her GI was doing okay with that. But someone, it, you know, cardiovascular disease is quote unquote, the silent killer. Cause you know, you don't, you don't necessarily get angina pectoris because you've got a la bad lipid profile, you know, until finally you do have a clot that causes right. a heart attack. So, so, so I'm then gonna, I'm, I'm going to hijack that for one second before you go on. So I, that speaks to something that I don't think people pay enough attention to is the cumulative effect of bouts of high inflammation, or, you know, even if your blood work returns to normal, having those periods where your blood work is out of whack cumulatively over time, you will see deleterious health effects. It's, it, it's unavoidable. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think people need to pay attention to trends in their blood work. So getting blood work, not only when you are between cycles of anabolics, but while you're actually on anabolics and seeing how bad is your blood work actually getting is it returning back to normal? If you go on again, is it getting worse than it was before? Then are you going back to normal? I think that's a really important point to right. make that cumulative effect. Yeah, there, I mean, for instance, there's, there, there is like animal work looking at literally atherogenesis showing that you can't, that can retreat to some degree. Um, but you know, if you've got calcify, calcifications there, that's gonna be a, a little bit of a different story. So right. you can like, let's say you push hard for a while and then you're healthy for a while, you can, you can probably reverse some of those things, but we know actually inflammation, it sounds like, you know, you're, 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 you're all over the inflammation when rightfully so it's inflammatory, inflammatory markers are predictive of longevity. Right. Very yeah, strongly. For sure. yeah. And, um, and psychological stresses, actually there's a, uh, um, I was, there's a podcast I, or a presentation I listened to from a German researcher and he was talking about a study just heard this the other day. So didn't read the study. I want to go find it though. Uh, it was a pretty clear one. Um, that's why he talked about it where they basically, they we wanted to figure what the most stressful situation was and contest prep and actually bodybuilding off season where you're pushing the limits and you're constantly full and you know, you're, you're stressing yourself. You're literally like trying to like, you're, you're putting your massive stresses on your system. You know, Absolutely. you're trying to adapt at the same time. Anyway, the most stressful situation that these researchers could come up with was caring for a loved one who was, who was, you know, on the, on, on the, his or her deathbed. So as a, in a caretaker scenario, and they measured a number of, of um, uh, inflammatory markers. And basically they, they had, uh, I think a five-year follow-up compared to a, a control group and compared to the control group um, progress and what was predictive from those markers, five years was equivalent to 20 years of aging. And they saw that in the blood work and they also saw that in the telomeres that they sampled. So you guys know about aging in telomeres. Mm -hmm. talk about that. So literally it's not just like, this is something that would, you know, telomeres aren't going to, they're not going to rapidly come back. You know, you might get a, go on vacation, your cortisol levels come down after, you know, a few days or a week, but your telomeres aren't going to all of a sudden, you know, revert back in a, a couple of weeks to where they were five years previous to that. So that's the thing, you know, there's, there's a kind of a toll to be paid to some degree, you know, with all of this and even the blood work, you know, and the card, like the things you're talking about doesn't even tell you, like you may get your blood lipids back, back to where they once were, but you know, who knows exactly what's going on on the, in the intima of your endothelia and your, um, and your arteri ar arterioles and your arteries. I mean, um, we can look at prox we can look at proxies of those things like CRP, you can get a calcium score done, you can get right. an ECG done. And you know, I implore people to do those things. In Canada, right. it's a bit tough to get those electively, but 
uh, it can be done. And I think that's why it's called a safer use model and not a safe use model because right. these are drugs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then uh, worth, worth noting, just one thing, just a lot of people look, because I don't see that this is as well known as it probably should be, but creatinine is something that you would expect to see at higher levels in someone who has lots of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. right. blood, blood creatinine um, has actually been used as a surrogate measure of muscle mass um, in long-term studies, looking at wasting and those sorts of things. So if you have, and talking about following, this is what kind of triggered this in my head, following your blood work, if your creatinine levels are, are rising progressively more, relatively more quickly than your muscle mass, that probably is something to be concerned about. I'm not a doctor, so I can't diagnose, but cystatin C is a measurement that can be made that's indicative of glomerular filtration, right? So, so generally kidney health. And that's one that, that people can, people can look into because mm -hmm. a lot of times, especially I had clients who like woke up in the morning, they were fasted and they took their creatine because they're just got to have to have your creatine. And they went in and they had elevated creatinine and I was like, well, yeah, just took creatine. It yeah. converts right, right to creatinine. And it probably shows up as a false positive on the test anyway. Um, so that's one to watch out for. These liver enzymes also, those are released from the liver cells and they tend to be in higher concentration. They're also found in skeletal muscle cells. So when you go and train your ass off and you've got muscle damage, you'll see creatine phosphokinase of the muscle isozyme kind, but you'll also see ALT and AST elevations. So ALT is more indicative of the liver. So if the ALT, if those are tip actually you may even have to wait a week there's one study that that follow those in a number of individuals after a, a muscle injury protocol and there are elevations like five six days after the the exercise so if you want to really get a, a an idea of if your liver as far as those enzymes goes there's other things you can look at but don't just believe that those are telling you everything if you're going in and you're giving yourself four days off and it's a little bit elevated it's someone who trains hard and regularly those are almost always elevated and they if they're they're, they can be very much the same when they're on versus off cycle. And the source of that elevation is, is likely in most of these cases, just skeletal muscle. It's not because the liver is terribly stressed. So, so, so if you were introducing like newer compounds and trying to be as safe as possible, would you say introduce that compound, get blood work done two to three weeks after you introduce it to see what's going on? And then if there's very negative ramifications, you can scratch that off your list of compounds to, to take or like, yeah. how would you recommend blood work to kind of showcase what you should and should not associate and take? It'd be great if you could just like do blood work every week, you know? <laughs> just kind of well, isn't that what they're, um, are you, do you follow David Sinclair and his, uh, his bio tracker stuff that he does? I know who he is, but I don't follow him enough to know what he's. What They're trying to do something like that where you have this bio tracker and you can get blood work done pretty much anywhere you go. And, and it's just something that keeps track of your blood work on a weekly basis. Yeah. And he's trying to get it put into like grocery stores and, and stuff like that. Oh, wow. That yeah. would be cool. Just yeah. Like a CBC and a metabolic profile, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, those, those can be pretty cheap too. You know, you get like, a, that's not, not a bad idea, but you'll, you'll see the, the liver, that's the thing. Like, if you think you're in the clear after two weeks, you may not be in the clear after five weeks. Right. So there's just like, there's, there's no, I, I don't have an, like, you'd have to ask someone like Dr. Serrano or a physician who's seen enough of this blood yeah. work to have a, a better, my, my best guess is that you would just be guessing to some degree, but yeah. that's a good, like with orals, you're going to see that elevation pretty rapidly. Um, and like, for instance, like Anavar is notorious for dropping HDL levels. That'll happen. That can happen really, really quickly. Um, uh, you know, some people like there are some things like people use IGF one as a surrogate marker for whether the growth hormone is real. All the things being equal, that should be elevated in a week or two. So there's a time course for some of these things. Um, but like for instance, let's say you start D ball at the beginning of you start a big training cycle. And then you want to use ALT and AST as your in, in indicator of liver stress. And you just get a basic metabolic profile and that's all you get. You don't get al alkaline phosphatase. You don't get GGT or anything else. That's just, just that. Well, you those could be elevated just because you started training like a, like a crazy person. 
yeah, you know, in a way that you hadn't for the when you with your pre measures. So the the devil really is in controlling for everything other than what you've changed as much as you possibly can. So and I think the more it's sort of like you know you're throwing darts at a board and you're looking for where the holes are and you start painting a picture of how your blood work is and and it, we've talked about it already like it's it's so important to to see where you, like what's the trends over years like okay so two years ago when i did this with d-ball at the beginning of a training cycle for a, a competition or a meet or what have you this is where my alt and AST are. now it's 50 percent. they're both 50 percent higher and they look i see this trend i plot them out like they just they tend to be just rising like my liver isn't quite handling things the way it used to yeah. actually there's while I'm kind of rambling, there's just so much information here. It's hard to know where to, where to, how to compact it into a podcast. But one thing that a lot of older guys find is that they get an hematocrit increase from test use or just injectable use that they didn't get when they were younger. So their hematocrit will just go off the, off the charts, which means blood pressure issues, potentially and clotting issues as well. Yeah. And that's just an age change. You know, maybe it's from years of use um maybe it's from age it's hard to know because this happened over the course of time so it's hard to to spread those things out but um that's a tendency you know that people can watch so like the cycle that that did one thing 10 years ago or five years or even two years ago won't necessarily do the same thing this time because you're changed um to some degree you're a different yes, person there's the parallel there with training as well right like yeah you can't absolutely. train the same as you could when you were younger yeah, absolutely yeah those things need to be adjusted yeah. And then there's also, I mean, you can get blood work done, say, before you start a cycle to see maybe some of your genetic inheritance and be like, these yeah. are off the table because I'm predisposed for having already high RBC and hematocrit. So maybe I wouldn't do an equipoise, which raises red blood cell count. Maybe I'll just do something else. I already have low HDL and high cholesterol. So maybe I'll just stay away from orals completely because that'll just wreck it even, even more. Right. So right. like you said, having those time courses of before you start, while you're starting, after, and then just continue to track and monitor, being very diligent with it, I think is, is something that's very important. I don't think a lot of people do that. I think a lot of people are just like, this is my cycle and uh, who knows yeah. what's going to happen. And they, they're not diligently tracking it, but yet you ask them about their like nutrition. They're like, yeah, I track my rice to the gram. And it's like, you don't do that with your drug protocol. And that's like the most important yeah. thing to do. Well, you don't want to know to some degree. You know? Yeah, it's true. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we could speak on a little bit of the idea of like, poly, like within the safer use model, like the polypharmacy, like we're talking about hematocrit, for example. Right. So people will like, oh, shoot, my hematocrit's high. I'll just go give blood. Like, right. Well, why is your hematocrit high? They won't address the root cause of the problem. Right. Um, even something like, you know, uh, my ferritin is really high. Well, if your creatinine's normal or if your hematocrit's normal, but your ferritin's high, maybe you're not filtering out hemoglobin as well. Maybe there's liver stress, maybe blah, 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 blah. So going down that list and understanding you don't need to be adding in, all right, my estrogen's high, I'm going to take aromatase inhibitor. Well, why don't you just look at the combination of drugs you're using right. so you don't have to use more drugs to combat your drugs? Yeah, I think, I think behind that, like, just to kind of understand, if I think you, if you know thyself, if you know why you want to do those things, it's because <clears throat> some people just respond really well to drugs. They do really, really well. So, you know, you might know someone who did great with 600, 800 milligrams of testosterone, and they never took an aromatase inhibitor at all. Right. No, no need to, they're, they're fine. No gyno tendencies, no water, like nothing's going on there. But for you, the person who decides they need an AI, they just don't get the same respond and they response and they aromatize really, really easily, really, really well for whatever. So you want to, you, you choose those, those drugs that have those, those, those actions, because those are the ones that you have a sense are going to be the most effective. And so you've got really two choices to, to kind of juggle. This is a great topic, Paul. This is so so important because it's like so am i trying to put a square peg in a round hole by using a drug that my body seems to want to be produce a lot of side effects to so to speak that i tend to aromatize so maybe i don't use so much aromatizable stuff 
or that gives me a, you know, a polycythemia, elevated hematocrit, um, and just go to something else? Or, or am I just, if, is it, am I trying to put a round peg in a square hole as far as just trying to get gains from these drugs when I'm using them at such high levels that I'm getting sort of spillover side effects? Right. Um, there, you know, some people have just tremendous, like one of the things that, you know, has been a, something I've kind of picked up on and I've heard many people say is that like some of, like a lot of the, the, the pro bodybuilders, guys who do really, really well, not all of them. Some of them are just, they're just freaks in general. And there's a lot of convergence between the genetics and the pathways for muscle growth and those that are, that are converged on by androgens too. But that a lot of those guys just have really hardy constitutions and they can handle a lot of drugs. Mm -hmm. This isn't to say that they maybe don't have like horrible things going on, but they've got something about them that can handle that. And some people don't, you know, and it's, it's very much the same way with training. Um, yeah. The more you can train, the better, as long as you can recover. Yeah. And I always talk about this because it was just like, ah, finally I got like this. It was just like a really valuable piece of evidence Brandon Curry was on, on our podcast talking about training at oxygen and how um, there are guys who come over there who are pretty advanced bodybuilders who try to like get in the flow of the training that he's doing and some of the top guys are doing that have been over there and they can't handle it. So what happens, what you, the phenomenon that's going on over there is they just do like this crazy high volume, high effort level training that only the genetic elite can recover from but you've got a tremendous stimulus. And as long as you recover, you've got a tremendous growth potential, but if you don't recover, you're not good. So the same thing goes with drugs is like, if you're, if you've got the genetics to re, to be able to handle those drugs without the sides, excess estrogen or hematocrit or what have you, then you're going to grow really, you do really well with them. But if you, if for you, you know, the max dose without, side over spill uh, uh, side effects spillover so to speak is a much smaller dose and that probably means you're just not going to be able to handle a higher dose you're probably not going to be a great responder um that i like that because it removes emotion from the, the conversation i think a lot especially yeah. with powerlifting and dealing with younger like i shouldn't say younger less experienced powerlifters you have this like emotional attachment to compounds like oh i have to take trend during meat prep like do you right. <laughs> I have to take anadrol during meat prep. Do you? Yeah. And the answer is no, right? If you're, if, if every time you take train, you can't sleep, you can't eat and you have heartburn all the time. Are you really going to be recovering as well as you need to in training as hard as hard as you possibly can? Probably not. Yeah. Do you know the, but the placebo studies that have been done, there's my favorite one that wasn't, that wasn't done with powerlifters, but there's actually one that was done with powerlifters where okay. basically the, the, you know, you probably read this one, the powerlifters were, they totally fell for it, just like in the others. I can't remember all the details of that study, but so what you think you need to have, what you need to work, you could just say, here's your halo, buddy. This is going to make you a fucking animal. You're going to well, just stay sure. at home, just stay at home and don't talk to anybody because you're going to be so aggressive. <laughs> yeah. And they just sit at home with their sugar pills and, you know, and, and think that they're you know, the devil incarnate, but it's just a placebo. So yeah, it's, it very, it very much is. And um, like that's, that's the thing I've seen, you know, there's, there are lots of guys, you know, on, on the sort of the upper level amateur level, like a lot of guys who are, aren't pros or, you know, maybe could, they could probably step on a national stage, but guys who use tons of stuff and they just haven't got the genetics for putting on muscle mass. It's not what their bodies are kind of designed to do genetically. And so you got to, you got to sort of, um, kind of take that grain of, take that, you know, that, that not, don't take it personally. It's just how you are. Like, it's not because of your personal weakness or what have you, it's just part of the, the nature of the game for you, but you're not gonna be able to use massive amounts of stuff. Um, right. and you'll have to be, this is what the safer use is about is finding what's safe for you, not just in general. And understanding that there's other pieces to this puzzle, not just drugs. Like I, I find, you know, I train in the past, like I used to train at powerlifting gyms. So it's just, just powerlifters. Now mm -hmm. a lot of young bodybuilders in our gym and, you know, like 240 pounds, I have a little bit of muscle mass. They come and ask the goal, you know, Hey man, what are you running? What are you doing this? And, you know, I'm, I'm honest with them about, you know, what's going on and, and they see me training and I actually got the opportunity to train with a couple of them. Yeah. 
<laughs> like you guys do not need to be talking about drugs. Yeah. You need to be talking about food. You need to talk about training. Mm-hmm. Like this is, this is not how you get the job done. Yeah. There's, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm doing a podcast tomorrow. It's the, we're going to talk about natty versus enhanced. Okay. And um, like one of the things I wanted to like kind of talk about is like, so what do the drugs do? And that's actually, I didn't know that we'd fit this in here, but it, it matches what you're saying. Is, even with you look at the research there's there's studies like the the bosin study from 96 that, that people talked about and there's um there's an there's another study as well that that demonstrated like just giving this was like not more than like 300 milligrams of testosterone actually lost some body fat and increased fat free mass in the bosin study the the subjects who were given 600 milligrams to test a week they averaged about college age some of them were a little bit older but they gained as much muscle cross-sectional area and fat-free mass as over 12 weeks as the group that trained. Mm-hmm. So you get, you get something from it. Right. Um, but here's the thing, like, so, so it gives you this, it gives you free gains basically. Once you get, once you like, even if you're not training, you're getting something from the drugs right off the bat. But if you just went on, let's say 500 milligrams of test, that would be like training and then just keeping your weights and your reps the same and just doing the same thing for the next two years. If you don't have some, if you don't have the fuel in terms of food and the progression and the training, then the drugs aren't going to do, do anything for you. So if you're not eating enough to, to supply the fuel and provide the protein and all those good things that nutrition gives you to where the drugs are going to be able to have anything to work with, you'll get that. So you get that. It's almost like, um, it's like a bait and switch because the drugs think it's like, Oh, I just take the drugs and I'll just kind of grow it. You do. You'll, you'll leap forward, you know, substantially um, mm-hmm. for many people, but then without the training and the progression there, then you may, you have a, a probably a better slope in terms of your progress with the drugs. But if you're not training progressively and eating progressively, then you don't have any slope. And zero times 10 or 20 or a million is still zero. <laughs> yeah, right. So you can't, you can't make something out of nothing if you're not eating enough. And that's hard thing, especially if someone started on a cycle, they, they have an impression from that first cycle that it's just going to be, be like that. And that's, that's why everyone says that first cycle is the, you know, that's the golden one. You know, that's your, that's your sort of your, your um, virgin experience. And it will, without any training, the studies, some, some of the studies show when the doses are high enough, you'll get tremendous leap forwards in terms of body composition and strength even a little bit. So I think that's what people kind of, like what you said has, it has to be recognized is that this is, you know, it's sort of like, um, you think of it like creatine, you know, Cre- like super, super dose, dose creatine, like you're going to get something from creatine. But you just can't just take creatine and expect to, you know, keep gaining weight from creatine, you know, just forever. You have right, to right. eat. And like all those, like if creatine's having an ergogenic effect, then you have to train to take advantage of that. The drugs are having a, and enhancing your protein synthesis and your recovery. You have to train and so that that can lend itself to the, the stimulus that you've already set in place with the training and help with the nutrient partitioning and the nutrient utilization because you're eating enough to make the gains actually happen. It's, it's actually, there's a, a paper that um, really kind of, kind of cool. It takes a lot of calories to gain muscle at a, a significant rate. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and it's, it, the thing is, is that you're not going to partition it very well um, necessarily. You might get a P ratio of 0.5 or something like that. So, but if you try to eat too little, and this is the, this is the interesting thing. I think that a lot of people don't, um, it's a hard thing to do, especially if you're trying to keep your body fat low, is that if you want to gain new muscle, you've got some P ratio that is a function of your genetics, how you're training, of course, too, and then maybe your drugs. So if you give someone, you know, it may be that you don't gain muscle at all until you have, let's say, a 300 calorie a day caloric deficit, just making up some numbers here, I don't have any hard data, but you have to have some, or sorry, not deficit, excess. So you have to be eating enough to get to get something. And then when you go to 500, you're only getting, let's say 200 out of that 500 going to muscle mass. So you got a P ratio of maybe, you know, two pounds of fat free mass to three pounds of fat, which, you know, isn't, isn't terrible. If you do that for, um, 
you know, let's say you put on 25 pounds or, or uh, yeah, 25 pounds, 15 pounds of fat, 10 pounds of true muscle over a year. And you can hold on to eight pounds of that and drop those 15 pounds of fat. That's a pretty good year, actually. Oh, yeah. Not bad yeah. at all. And that's But that's a terrible P-ratio. And you may not get there unless you get enough food in. So the gear will help with that. But again, if, you're, if your excess is zero and you're not over that, you know, whatever it is that you need to have to be making progress, then you're just, you're just pissing in the wind to some degree. Yeah, people are always looking to progress their drug protocols instead of progressing their training and nutrition. And it's funny because you see a lot of the top guys now talk about how they're getting their nutrition and training dialed in and they're taking less gear than they've ever taken before and they're seeing more progress because they focused on the other two driving factors instead of just the drugs itself. Yeah. I, and you know, it's, it's funny. I think there's something to that because once you're to the point where you're training that hard and you're eating that much food, um, that's, you've got accumulative stress. That's, that's in the stress pool with the drugs. Yeah. So what you can handle and not have that toxicity inflammation is less so you're getting going to get less from more because you simply can't handle more because you have so many other stresses so yeah yeah that makes sense absolutely all right well in true dr question. scott fashion we got one question done in an hour so. one of five <laughs> <laughs> yes we did oh, so well. that's i mean that's that's i mean to me that's one of the more important questions out of all the ones we we had yeah. so i think that's a good one to to cover and, and go through and like i said if you guys are interested in more of this stuff. Dr. Scott has a podcast of his own that I recommend you guys check out with uh, Scott McNally. And uh, he goes over a lot of this stuff in, in detail. And it's usually one question and, and uh, an hour long yeah, <laughs> answer. But, you know, sometimes your answers preclude more questions that you don't want to just gloss over, right? You want to cover things as succinctly as possible. So we appreciate your time. And is there anything else that, you may want to touch on that we didn't go over with this with this one question before we log off here um yeah i mean i guess you don't need to use drugs to bodybuild of course like that's yeah. sort of the obvious right. thing um that uh that i think I, i'll say this like when it comes to the drug because there's probably some people that are listening thinking, well do i want to take that plunge or do i not and um a lot of times, like one thing I think that's pretty clear is that it, you, you've got bodybuilders that are, that are, that are going to rise to the top as amateurs and those are going to rise to the top as pros. And they're probably aside from the, or as IFBB pros. So gear using non-tested pros, let's say, and there you've got, you, you can figure out whether you've got really good genetics from training three, four, five, 10, 15 years, or however long, you know, where you're going to be. And then what's going to happen thereafter. So, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to know, for instance, if you've got IFBB pro caliber genetics and whether you could do that, if train for three or four, three or four years, get everything you possibly can. I think there was one question that maybe pointed to this. And if you are outpacing everybody that, you know, is natural, that's kind of hard to say, then you probably got good genetics. You may be happy yeah. with that, but, but give it a go because so often, um, what you, what you're basically, what you're doing to, to can be to some degree, unless you're like, you're all in, this is just, you know, this is your passion is that, is that you, if you start off and start using gear, then that's going to be something for many people, not necessarily, but that is going to be, um, and I've seen this so many times. I know people who don't train and they don't exercise unless they're using gear um, and they're, they get caught in a psychological, yeah. Have you seen this before? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. 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 And it's, it's kind of like, oh man. So, so you, you sort of like, do you, do you want to be beholden to that to some degree? Because you set a standard for yourself. So where do you want to go long-term? So enjoy the training and the eating and all that, all those sorts of things. And once you got that down, like there are guys, we may have talked about this on, on your podcast. It came up sometime recently. There are guys that, you know, competed for a long time or competed for a while. who were really good. who got their pro cards or were at the top of the amateur ranks who then took the plunge, went to the dark side, and then they became extraordinary pros. 
Um, and I'm thinking of guys like I'm guessing Jose Raymond, this probably applies to who yeah. earned his pro card. You know, Sean Clarita was an, was a natural pro. And then he, Qu you know, Quinton like, Aria also got his IFBB pro card natural from what I hear. Yeah. Canadian right. Guy. Um, and Kai Green as well. Kai Green, Ronnie Coleman, probably, you know, very minimal yeah. stuff. So there's all these tremendous guys and they were tremendous as amateurs. So you'll, you'll kind of know what's, what, what, what's up, you know, in the first you know, three or four or five years because you'll outpace your peers because you've got great genetics. Yeah. Same but thing with powerlifting too. A lot of the top powerlifters that compete in drug tested federations, they're, they move over to non-drug tested federation and they just become the best in the world. And I think you should try to compete, right? And see yeah. where you're at with your peers. And if you're ahead of them, like you said, then then you time to consider it, right? But not yeah. until you actually dive deep into like, how can I be the best at it without taking drugs? Would you consider even looking at it is the way I, I, I tend to talk to people about it. Yeah. And I tell you, like if literally let's, let's say you're someone who has great perspective and they know that, that this person knows that they want to, they want to win the Mr. Olympia, the time to learn the ins and outs of what works for you in terms of nutrition and training, those sorts of things is when you're natural because there's then this this film of the the advantage that the gear gives you which changes things and you don't you don't see how important for you you know nutrient timing might be or your sleep you can make a lot of mistakes in many cases so the best time to learn is when you don't have that as opposed to sometimes you see people who just and that sometimes it's people with really good genetics so it doesn't matter if they know anything they just respond no matter what but if you add gear in there and then you're getting gains no matter what you do, you're not learning anything. So then, then if you have to use those to kind of maintain the size that you're at, let's say, um, you've missed out on that opportunity to kind of get become a smarter bodybuilder in a way that will make you better as a geared bodybuilder. Because you know those things that are working. You know the effect of gear and the other things. So there's a lot, of, lot to be learned. Just like take, in, take your time. You know, for the average 20-year-old, got plenty of time to use gear in the future. But now is the time maybe to to not do that if that's um you know if you're if you're in that in that boat that we're talking about nobody wants to be that guy taking buckets of gear and totaling 1200 pounds yeah <laughs> right <laughs> you've seen them though right i'm sure oh yeah oh yeah. Yeah. oh yeah yeah right all right well thank you dr scott we appreciate your time and and Welcome like always gentlemen. guys make sure you go check out fortitude training and uh be your own bodybuilding coach and dr scott's podcast that he has out and uh, his Instagram, those are the best ways to, to get a hold of him and support him and uh, continue to support him. And if you buy his books, you're going to get a lot of this stuff that we talked about in, in great detail and kind of lead you down the path, uh, both naturally and, and, and enhanced as well. So definitely continue. And also, too, if you buy Dr. Scott's stuff, uh, you become a member on his board and his forum where he answers questions and there's years of questions on there so it's a, it's a wealth of, of knowledge that I, I highly recommend for you guys so dr scott thank you for your time we appreciate thank you, you sir thanks guys yeah paul have, have a good one happy new year, happy new year. yeah